If you could go back to the days of the Apostle Paul, uh, you would discover that most religious or devout Jews had the game of religion mastered. Uh, They would have assumed that they had a monopoly on how to win heaven. They knew the rules of the game. They even knew those rules that were hard to remember. They, they could just sort of strut around Jerusalem because they, they believed that they owned a piece of heaven. But their bank accounts of religious rituals and ceremonies that just seemed so impressive were really like the game of Monopoly's money. If you've ever played that game before, you may have stayed up until one o'clock in the morning. You purchased those houses and properties and you collected stacks of Monopoly money Maybe you even won the game uh, that night. Well, all your Monopoly money was good for that game, but you could never go down to the bank and try to deposit it. Uh, Monopoly money is worthless in the real world. Well, in the same way, the impressive currency of religious ceremonies, well, that can't transfer into the bank of heaven. No matter how much you have, no matter how much you accumulate, it'll never purchase your redemption. So the question becomes, what kind of currency does God accept? Well, Paul has already answered here in verse 3 that heaven only negotiates in the currency of God's righteousness. That's the only kind of money, so to speak, that the bank of heaven accepts. Everything else is just just play money, monopoly money. It's make-believe. So the important question uh, for us to this day is this, how do we get the currency of God's righteousness into the wallets of our souls? Well, Paul answers here in verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, what does he mean here that Christ is the end of the law? Well, we've explained before that as followers of Christ, we're not under the Old Testament law. We're no longer controlled by the law. We're not subjected to it. Romans chapter 6, verse 14 explains it. But Paul is saying something a little different here. The Greek word he uses for end, the end, is telos. That means goal or culmination. Many commentators, in fact, prefer to translate Romans 10, 4 to say it this way, Christ is the goal of the law. That means the law culminates in Christ. The law pointed to Christ. The law anticipated the arrival and the perfect work of Christ. So Christ is where the law leads you. The law shows you the need for a Savior. It shows you the need for His righteousness that only He can provide because we can't can't keep the law perfectly. Well, now Paul proceeds in this passage to contrast two kinds of righteousness. One kind of righteousness is, well, it's like monopoly money. It can give you a good feeling of success and and, and wealth, but it's, it's just a game. The other kind of righteousness is real. It's authentic, spiritual currency. Paul writes about it here in verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. The one who seeks righteousness through obedience to the law, however, is doomed. And that's because nobody can keep this righteous standard. Now, beginning here in verse 6, Paul quotes the Lord's words from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 to 14, and he's going to provide some commentary of his own as he goes along. Paul writes here in verse 6, Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or, who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. In other words, you need to know how to properly respond to God. Nobody has to go up into heaven to bring Christ down. Why? Well, because Christ has already come down. And nobody has to descend into the abyss, the grave, to bring Christ up from the dead. Why? Well, because he's already risen from the dead. His work of salvation is complete. And this message is near, Paul writes. It's near to the readers of this text, according to verse 8. You don't have to go searching for it. It's all readily available. It's completed. It's culminated in the work of Christ. 
So the true currency of the gospel, which, by the way, is the only currency accepted in the bank of heaven, well, you don't have to go earn that. You don't have to go win a game to get it. It can be deposited into your bank account of life upon your salvation. This is by the grace of God. This is given to you by faith in Christ alone. I read about one student who recounted a rather unforgettable experience that illustrates this issue of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. Uh, She left work early so she could have some uninterrupted study time before her final exam there at Hannibal College in Missouri. When she finally got to class, everybody was doing their, you know, their last minute cramming, their last minute studying. The teacher came in and said that he would review with the class uh, before the test. And of course, they appreciated this review, came right out of the study guide. But there were some things that he was reviewing that most of the class had not studied. And when he was questioned about it, he said, well, these things were in the book and the students were responsible for everything in the book. Well, they, they couldn't argue with him about that. Finally, it was time to take the test, and the professor placed their exams face down on their desks, and when everyone had one, he told them to turn them over and begin. And to the students' astonishment, they found that every question on the test was already answered. The blanks were already filled in, by hand, and each student's name was written on his or her exam in red ink. And at the bottom of the last page, the professor had written these words This is the end of the exam. All the answers on your test are correct. You're going to receive an A on your final exam. The reason you've passed this test with an A is because the creator of the test took it for you. All the work you did in preparation for this test did not help you get this A on the exam. Well, the professor went around the room and asked each rather stunned, shocked student individually, what is your grade? And they all answered, an A. And then he asked each student, did you deserve this grade that you're receiving today? And every student had to say, no. Then he said, you know, some things you've learned in this class from my lectures and some things you've learned from research and reading the material, but some things uh, you can only learn from experience. And you have just experienced grace. You know, I think that's what Paul is declaring here in Romans chapter 10. This is the word that you have. There's no impartiality with God. Jew and Gentile alike are included. Paul writes here this glorious truth now in verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus Christ came down from heaven. He rose up from the grave to offer his free gift to you. Jesus is the solution to this final exam. He's handwritten all the answers required of you for salvation. He's even written your name in his roll book of everlasting life in red, blood red. You had nothing to perform, no perfect score to earn on your own in order to have your name entered, and yet there it is. And beside your name in the register of heaven is a perfect score. An A plus. Well, this passage in Romans 10, beginning here in verse 4, with Paul's explanation of God's righteousness through the living word, this is connected also to verse 8, to the spoken word, the word of faith, he writes, that we proclaim. This law that was delivered at Mount Sinai, well, grace was delivered at Mount Calvary. The righteousness of the law Well, trying to keep that leads to legalism. The righteousness of the Lord, well, that leads to liberty. See, grace is not a benefit of the law. It is a blessing from the Lord. Salvation is not the result of a faultless performance. It's a relationship with a faultless person, Jesus Christ. He's our hope. 
He's our righteousness. We can do nothing to earn this. We can only receive it by faith. In fact, Paul writes this precious promise here in verses 9 through 11. Let me just read them. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Let me tell you, beloved, we all earned a failing grade in life. Why? Because we're all sinners. Well, that's all replaced by grace through faith in Christ with a perfect score. Jesus essentially gives us his grade. He is our amazing Savior. And this is why we call it amazing grace. Now, until we set sail again, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.